Adrian Flux sponsors coverage of the Silverstone Classic. Rocking and racing come together this weekend for the Silverstone Classic, the biggest historic motor racing festival in the world. Welcome to the 2019 Silverstone Classic, a historic motor racing festival on a scale like no other, with a mind-boggling array of cars competing in 20 races. What that essentially means is there's more racing going on here over one weekend than anywhere else in the world. So if you love your classic cars, this is the place to be. It's a festival like Glastonbury, but here it's the cars that take centre stage. Here's what we have in store for you in the show. We'll be celebrating 60 years of the Mini, both on and off track with rallying legend Paddy Hopkirk. There's action from the mighty historic F1 cars and we'll be chatting with triple Formula One champion, Sir Jackie Stewart. We'll also be marking Bentley's centenary here at the Classic, while Louise and I get out and about exploring this incredible event. There's everything that a car fan wants. There's stuff on the track, there's stuff off the track. I'm here with my kids. There's a theme park, there's food, there's a Helter Skelter, a, a big wheel, there's music in the evening. You know, I love coming to this show because it caters for absolutely everyone. We've been up here as a family to come and have a look a couple of times in the previous years, so it's been nice to hear different engines and uh, see how things were bolted together back in the day. The Silverstone Classic is a great event. I mean, it's great entertainment, it's a great family event. You know, there's so many other things to look at. And a correction of cars like you might never see anywhere in the world. Yeah, I did the Classic maybe four or five years ago uh, for, for my honeymoon. <laughs> yeah, we come here for our honeymoon. And I had to uh, do a bit of talking to, to get the green light on that one. You know, it's a great event for, for our family. You know, I, I only live 20 minutes away now, but, but we camped this weekend. I think you really need to be here two or three days to, to try and consume everything that's in sort of both sides of, uh, of the pits. was an important year in the career of Sir Jackie Stewart. After four years trying to win the British Grand Prix, he finally achieved that goal on his fifth attempt here at Silverstone. And it paved the way to the first of his three Formula One world titles. To win your own Grand Prix is a big deal. I mean, if you haven't won your own Grand Prix, then your CV isn't complete. Uh, to win it at Silverstone particularly, I, I was a big fan of Silverstone because it's such a high speed circuit. Uh, to do it in this car was kind of special and the race was extremely unusual in that it was so close between Jochen and I. Well, I was sitting in the grandstand of Woodcut myself watching it go and it was one of the most entertaining races ever and very exciting from the cockpit I'm sure. Woodcut in those days was a fantastic corner. It was about 153 miles an hour around there. You really had to, it was supposed to be flat, but flutters maybe more appropriate. But uh, you know, Silverstone's the home of British motorsport in the modern world. So to be back again is just very nice to be. What was it like driving the car again at this weekend? It's a car that hasn't changed much. The owners kept it original. Um, you know, I I don't want to go into the end of Hangar straight into Stoke Corner very quickly anymore because I don't know whether the brakes are still there after 50 years. But no, it's a, it's a pleasure to drive it. it. It was a fairly long wheelbase car. It was a nice car to drive. So, no, I enjoyed it very much. And of course, it brought me the World Championship as well, which wasn't all bad. Mark 50 years since Sir Jackie Stewart's first Grand Prix victory here at Silverstone. The historic F1 race has been renamed the Sir Jackie Stewart Trophy and there is an incredible array of cars taking part. Always a big draw for the crowd. The historic Formula 1 cars, the Sir Jackie Stewart Trophy for the FIA Masters Historic F1s. 
20 minute race, all these Cosworth engine cars with the ensign of Kyle Tilly on pole position, Steve Hartley's McLaren MP41 in second, and that's Katsuka Botas, black and gold Lotus 91 in third place. So maintaining grid order at the start of the race, second of the orange and white McLarens, that's the older M26 of Michael Lyons, he's in fourth. Already putting pressure on the Lotus, doesn't want to allow the leaders to escape. Fabulous sights and sounds, dating from the early 70s into the early 80s, a variety of cars here. And Kyle Tilly, the pole sitter, steaming down towards the complex. Michael Lyons showing his nose down the inside. There goes Martin Stratton in the green Tyrrell. And as Kubota drifts out a little wide, he's lost third place to Michael Lyons. On the inside is the first the Williams is, that's Mike Cantillon. And a challenge for the lead, Steve Hartley on the inside. He's got a good run down past the old Formula One pits, the pits these cars would have used in period. He goes ahead of Kyle Tilly in the inside. And the McLaren, the first of the carbon fiber chassis, Ron Dennis here in McLaren's. Moving up as well is Michael Lyons into the Beckett Tesses. He is up now to make it a 1-2 for McLaren in the older M26. Steve Tilly in third, Kubota's Lotus in fourth, Wobbly front wing on the number seven car. Mike Cantillon, the FW07C. He's got Martin Stretton's Tyrrell right behind. They're going two wide. Katsu Kubota on the inside in the black and white Lotus. He moves up into third ahead of our pole man, Kyle Tilly. And here comes Cantillon, he's making the move in the Williams as well. Having a look at the back of the red ensign, but Martin Stretton up the inside. He picked up two places there. So Stretton was behind the Williams down the straight. He's now ahead and up to fifth position. Still McLaren 1-2. Steve Hartley under real pressure though from Michael Lyons. Lyons might be in an older car, but he knows this Silverstone Grand Prix circuit well, knows his car well. And as the hunter, he's got the ability to put his car wherever he wants to. Our race leader, Steve Hartley, having to defend and try and escape at the same time. Katsu Kubota in third, Martin Stretton's Green Tyrrell in fourth, Coleman Carl Tilly in fifth. And he is ahead of the Williams and Mike Cantillon. Then there's Jamie Constable. He's next up. But he's under pressure because down the inside comes the race one winner, Matteo Ferraza, in that beautiful Ligier JS11. Looking to go the long way round the outside. It's not going to work for him here. Stretton moves ahead of Kubota. He's now up into third position. Look at them here, running out two wide. Lotus versus Enzyme, and Ligier versus Tyrrell. Fabulous Cosworth in the racing. Martin Stretton on the hunt for second place. Michael Lyons hanging on in the M26 McLaren. It's a late 70s car, Stretton's car from 1983. There's a lot of development in between the two eras. And down the inside comes Mighty Mouse through the goes into second place. The question is, can he catch the MP41 and challenge for the lead? There is the race leader, Steve Hartley. There is the green car of Martin Stretton in second. And the battle for third may not be over. Michael Lyons in third, but behind him in the Williams, the FW07 with a rocky front wing. Mike Cantillon has just set the fastest race lap to close right in on the third place, McLaren. And he hasn't got enough field to go around the outside or has he? He's going to try it. Put the McLaren under pressure. Of Mike Lyons right into that hairpin. He will come out onto the Wellington straight. Williams with a really good run. He's going to pull out of the slipstream and alongside. That is pretty hard to defend for Michael Lyons. Through into third place goes Mike Cantillon. And Michael Lyons now down to fourth position. The Williams FWA second car that really sealed Williams' position as a world championship winning constructor. Of Katsu Kubota. This is where it happened. The Lotus driving using the racing line, but the Williams finding a little more grip there. Katsu going through. Kubota battling now with the M26 McLaren. Six full seasons separating these two chassis. The M26 not successful when it was introduced in 1976. James on stage with the reliable M23 to win the world title that year. 
Whereas this Lotus was introduced in 1982, very different look, drive the fully forward long tunnels to maximise the ground effect. Black County on in the number seven, Williams now again the fastest race lap. Behind this pair though is another FW07. That is Christoph Dansenball closing in. Big mistake there. Under pressure from the Japanese driver in the Lotus. Runs out very wide. And loses a couple of spots. Gregor Fiskin retires the UOP shadow. Battle for the race lead. Dark clouds overhead, but no time to stare at them for Steve Hartley. He's got plenty to worry about in his mirrors. And McLaren MP41 being caught by the Williams FW07C. Final lap down the hangar straight. This is the perfect opportunity for Mike Cantillon. Trying to find a way down the inside, but not quite close enough as they go over and into Stowe. Can he do something through the veil and into club corner? Steve Hartley looks like he might just have enough to hang on. Took the lead early in the race and will be in the lead as the chequered flag comes out. It'll be Steve Hartley victorious from Mike Cantillon and Martin Stretton in third place in the Tyrrell. There he is. It's McLaren, Williams and Tyrrell. That could be any British race from the early 80s. Confirmation of our result then. Martin Stretton taking third, Mike Cantillon second, but our winner is Steve Hartley. And it is Hartley who receives the trophy from Sir Jackie Stewart. Trophy for first place. Well done. Congratulations to our winner, Steve Hartley. Among the other single seaters at Silverstone, there are two races for the HSCC Classic Formula 3 cars. In the first, Andrew Smith had his march on pole. In slippery conditions, moved unable to hang on, spinning away his advantage. Anthony Hancock's loader bumped David Leone's march into Stowe, both of them spinning out, and splashing his way to victory in a martini was Christian Olsen. And the young Dane reigned supreme in an even wetter race two. Victory is again. In the Galley Trophy for pre-66 Grand Prix cars, it was close at the front until Miles Griffiths spun his Lotus 16. And that allowed Will Muttle to escape for victory. His Cooper T53. Race two was dry and the pace was ferocious. Plenty of action all the way down the order. Time was battling hard for every inch of the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. This time, though, Victor went to Sam Wilson in his Lotus 18. The rain was definitely heavier for the HSCC historic Formula 2 cars, causing chaos. Miles Griffiths managed to hang on to claim victory in his role. Race two was almost as wet. Everybody had a better understanding of the conditions, though, and that led to plenty of wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. In the end, it was Martin O'Connell who came home first in a Chevron. After the break, the mighty minis will be in action here at the Silverstone Classic, and we meet rally legend Paddy Hopker. This year marks the 60th anniversary of the legendary Mini, the groundbreaking little car designed by Sir Alec Isagonis that became a classless British style icon of the 1960s. Its small design and front wheel drive gave it impressive handling. When the Cooper Car Company got involved, it became a rallying legend, winning the Monte Carlo Rally three times. The first of those wins came with Paddy Hopkirk, who I caught up with. Paddy, it's always good to see you, but particularly here at the Silverstone Classic with not just the car, but the actual trophy that you received for winning the, the Monte Carlo Rally in 1964. How good does it feel to be reunited? Well, it, it's very nice because the trophy has never been to Silverstone before. In fact, uh, this is the trophy that Princess Grace handed on, Prince Rainier handed me uh, 55 years ago, so it's lovely. And I actually took it to Monty five years ago for the 50th anniversary and I met Prince Albert and I showed it to him and I said, your mum gave me this trophy, so. 
It's a special year for, for the Mini, celebrating the, uh, the 60th anniversary this year here at Classic. You were partly responsible for making the Mini so famous, so iconic. That Monte Carlo win really thrust it centre stage, didn't it? Will you tell Mini that, please? <laughs> no, no, I was lucky. Listen, the fact that it was the district nurse's car and all the Ford and Mercedes were spending a fortune trying to win the Monte Carlo Rally. I mean, we didn't know we were going to win it. We surprised ourselves. I was lucky to be the guy behind the wheel at the time. And the swinging 60s was, it, it was big news because we ended up Sunday night in the Palladium and I think 27 million viewers saw that was Bruce Forsyth. So it was a terrific era. Marking this anniversary here at the Classic, we've got the mini celebration trophy race. The grid packed full of 56 minis. I think it's fair to say there's gonna be some close racing in this one. Mini celebration trophy. Darren Turner, the winner of race one, leads the field. They start as they finish race one. Chris Middlehurst, the green car with the Cooper stripes on the outside of the front row, row two. Touring car race, Adam Morgan and lifelong mini racer Ian Curley in the red machine. 20 minutes of mayhem gets underway in Davoic, slicing down the inside of former VW champion Flynn House. And it's one deal to the eight, ten wide into the first corner. What could possibly go wrong? Well, there's your answer. A few get spat out. 25, that's Barry Sign with Ian Curley in fourth place. Oh, in his mirror, somebody coming flying up the inside in a white car. That'll be Tom Bell. Darren Turner was there, and he pressed a look. The white car is still there, but it is this time Tom Bell. So he's gone by Ian Kirk, he's gone by Darren Turner. Kirk has gone by Turner. Turner lost a couple of spots. There's the 81 car. Ian Kirk's red machine inside him, and trading the bumper, the race leader, Chris Middlehurst. Signs of damage, he's lost a right and rear light as well. Slipstreaming down the straight though, the hill car, Adam Morgan, right machine, that's Tom Bell, 244, goes a long way round the outside. If he can have him there, that becomes the inside. No, not quite. Adam Morgan picks up a wheel, still Chris Middlehurst, the race leader. That's nearly three corners in a row. Back with the end of Owens. Owens trailing the minty blue. So it's Chris Middlehurst and Adam Morgan, and then 244 Tom Bell ahead of Ian Curley. And we are following right behind with Darren Turner, who in open on Tom Bell's car. Looks like he's lost the luggage though that normally sits on, on that downward folding bit of genius from Alicus Agonis. Look at the way these cars slide all over the place. There's only one rule in racing a mini. Control the front, rear will eventually follow. Doesn't matter what the angle of the dangle, if you keep your foot in, you should be good. It's exactly the opposite of what Darren Turner's used to in a 600 plus horsepower GT car. Down the long, almost interminable hangar straight, Michael Kane. No, no, not that one. Former British GT champion Michael Kane. He's in the mint coloured car. There is Adam Morgan. He's just been passed for second by Tom Bell. Absolutely flying, but if that's an aerodynamic aid now, that open boot lid on the Mini. At the completion of the first the, uh, round. Light uh, green car, the leaf green coloured, number 76. Often raced uh, by team boss Mick Swift, the uh, Swift uh, Tune uh, preparation uh, squad. Replay of that run down into the first corner from Endaf Owens. I'm not sure why he's looking alongside him at Phil House. Ought to be paying attention to what's going on in front as well. So much jockeying for position. Fantastic racing. Broad sideways slide from Chris Middlehurst. He's trailing a bumper right behind him. Trailing the boot lid is Tom Bell. And we're with Ian Curley Wolf taking the point in action. Looks like Bell missed a gear there. No more than that, perhaps he's broken a drive shaft. But that looks like the end of the race for Tom Bell. Meanwhile, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six strong lead group on board in third place now. Let's take a look again at the avoiding action. And Ian Curley 
reads that well. He sees Trauma coming, and he's almost steering before. It looks like the white car's slow. Michael Kane challenging Adam Morgan down the inside for third place. Kane, the British GT champion, also drove in two cars like Adam Morgan. There's not a lot of people know that. Morgan on the inside as Kane runs out wide. Leaders are still in touch as they head into the Beckett Sessors. Big slide there from Adam Morgan. Absolutely copybook mini racing now for the lead. We're on board with Ian Curley. Chris Middlehurst in front, they were second and fourth. And there's what a slipstream will do for you in the Swift 2 Mini. Slips up into second place. Around the outside, Michael Kane, the three wide, two wide into Stone. And on the inside, Curly, a little love tap there to Adam Morgan. Michael Kane gets a grandstand view. Not much to see in his rear view mirror. He is right in the thick of the action. He's up to second, back down to third. Pops the curves on the inside. And right behind, in the rear view mirror, you can see the red car of Ian Curley. On the right hand side on the pit wall, black and orange flag. That's for the race leader wanting him to come in and get his bumper fixed. Torn off probably, as is likely to be the case. Well, this is the onboard with Ian Curley and Adam Morgan. Oh, careful now. Oh, no, no, careful now. Oh dear. A bit robust for second. And again on board with Michael Kane. Down to fourth place, Adam Morgan's just shot past. He's trained to get a bumper overrider. And our race leader's going to have to get that bumper fixed if it doesn't fall off pretty sharpish. Michael Kane checking the mirrors for the presence of Darren Turner. White car not that close as we go by. Ian Curley on the outside. He picks up a double slipstream and the toe around the outside into Stone. Is he going to be in third? Is he going to be in second? Will he stay in fourth? Ian Curley on the inside. He's still there. He's still there. And Darren Turner's right there as well. But Michael Kane is in third place. Hard on the brakes. Down into second. Buzzing the engine up to 9,000 RPM. Yeah, contact with Curley. Dr. Curley's been a mini racer all his life. He knows all the tricks and a bit more. And there's Darren Turner on the inside. He's been a mini racer all weekend, but he's learned fast, hasn't he? Oh, dear. Curly making sure that everybody's got red paint. Maybe he got a job lot. Looks like a deleted rehearsal scene from the Italian job. I don't think any of these guys are in the self-preservation society right now. They all want to win this race. Leaders have broken away. Darren Turner back up to fourth. Here's Ian Curley on the inside. Big slide from Chris Middlehurst. He's done everything right, but that damage and a black flag. And that is it. He will have to head onto the pits now. He will not win the race. So that's a real heartbreak for Chris Middlehurst. He did nothing wrong, got hit from behind, but that damage came here on the very first corner. Contact with race one winner Darren Turner. Middlehurst trying to make enough room, didn't quite. Back on board with Michael Kane. Chasing Ian Curley. Now this is effectively for second place. Middlehurst is still in second on the road, but he has been DQ'd. So it's Ian Curley red. Mint is Michael Kane. And the white car behind is Darren Turner. Goes the long way round the outside. Now he's going to fling it through. Again, a good exit onto the chapel curb and down the hangar straight. He'll be giving away a slipstream, so will Kane. They need to gang up on Ian Curley in front. Two of these three will be on the podium. Which two? Kane's got a fabulous run down the hangar straight. Slingshots up behind Ian Curley. Has to go the long way round the outside. Cuts back in in front of Darren Turner. He's going to be Adam Morgan running clear in the front of the flag. Looks like our race one winner might be out of luck for the podium. 76. That is Adam Morgan. He is going to win it. Disqualified is the number three car, Chris Middlehurst. So who will be second behind our race winner? Adam Morgan claims victory. And in the charge to the line, it will be in.
Curley from Michael Kane, Darren Turner in fourth, and off end of Owens, Elliot Stafford rounding out the top half dozen. So Michael Kane finishing in third, Ian Curley in second, disqualification for Chris Middlehurst, but Adam Morgan was our race winner. On to the top step of the podium, guys, Adam. What if you want to go racing and have some fun, fun buy a mini. Yeah. I cannot tell you just how much fun they are to drive. <laughs> the racing is incredible, you know, I was missing gears, I was getting overtaken by four people, and then the next the next lap, you've you've got all back up again just through the toe, and it's just amazing. To Adam Morgan, super, thank you Nick for making the presentation. The action comes thick and fast in the classic, and the transatlantic trophy for 366 cars had plenty of drama from the off. Everyone pushing hard in the early stages, then Dave Bartram lost control of his Mustang, spinning into the traffic in the path of Martin Stroman, sending the field scattering. In the closing stages, the leaders had pulled away. It was a two-horse race until Craig Davis clipped beside him, Jake Hill putting him into a spin. It looked to be all over, but battle resumed. Then drama as Hill's tyre let go at speed on the hammer straight on the final lap. Fortunately, though, yellow flags were out ahead of him, meaning there was no overtaking. And on the rim, he managed to cling on to victory, to his obvious delight. There was a massive entry in the historic touring cars where the action is always close. Winner last year, Harry Whale was stuck in the thick of it of the BMW M3. In the end, it was Michael Lyons who roared to victory in his Sierra RS500. Join us after the break for more from the Silverstone Classic. Always the classic car auction is a big feature of the event and there are some stunning vehicles going under the hammer this year. Like this 1985 MG Metro 6R4, still in totally original condition, it's had two owners from new and I don't think either of them ever took it out in the forest because this car must be the only Group B rally car in the world that has just seven miles on the clock. Or how about this beauty? This is an Aston Martin DBS from 1970, but it has a very special history because this was the Aston Martin press car and it caused quite a stir in the media when it set an, an average speed of 160 miles an hour over a measured mile on the M4. But the star of the show is undoubtedly this baby. It's a Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Gullwing, originally built in 1954. It was imported into the UK in 1989 by Peter War, he of Lotus Formula One fame. I'm so tempted to put in a bid for this. How much is it going for? About a million pounds. A million pounds, maybe not. Parades are always an impressive sight in the classic with a huge number of cars taking to the track from the large number of clubs that attend the event. And there are some big celebrations in 2019. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the legendary Ford Capri, the car built as Europe's answer to America's Mustang. 2019 is also the 70th birthday of the Italian mark Arbath. Originally a sports car manufacturer, it's been famed for its long association with Fiat. For Bentley, it's the big one. 2019 marks the first century of car production for this British company. Despite the downpour, it was great to see some incredible examples of their machinery from across the years, including one owned by everybody's favourite gardener. I love vintage cars, and I've got a 1929 4.5 litre Bentley Le Mans, which I've driven all the way here and had the great good fortune to go round the circuit in. So, to have actually, at only 55 miles an hour, there were some cars in front of us and I couldn't go any faster. I'm not a speed merchant really, but I love old cars, classics. However, the Mini took centre stage celebrating its 60th birthday. Paddy Hopkirk in his Monte Carlo rally winning car leading the... There's so much to do at the Silverstone Classic that it's impossible to squeeze it all into one day. So this year, despite the odd spot of rain, I thought we'd go camping so we can get out and do as much as possible. Are you sure they said we could pitch here though, Tiff? Because there's something to me that doesn't feel quite right about it. It's fine. Nobody will notice us. Camping is 
arguably the best way to enjoy the Silverstein Classic. It allows you to make a base and explore from there at your leisure. I saw this at Bath Auto Test Challenge and just had to have a go. I used to rally, so it's no surprise these guys in the shift and drift zone caught my eye. Who doesn't love a bit of sideways action? Woo! And don't forget, there are thousands of classic cars of all shapes and sizes lined up for you to admire. And if you feel the need to unwind, then head here to the Village Green where you can relax, get something to eat or drink, and enjoy all the fun of the fair. There's also Mike Rural on stage of giving some advice on classic cars. The sticks Tiffany Dell! You can even practice your footy here at the Yokohama Chelsea Skills Zone. And as ever, the party keeps on going into the night down here on the main stage. And this year, things are getting a bit groovy. Lou, what are you doing? I'm channeling my inner hypnotist. Do you actually even know what groovy means? the greatest music festival of all time happened at Woodstock in the USA back in 1969. And 50 years on, that vibe of peace and love is all around Silverstone. There are tribute acts from some of the bands that performed at the festival, as well as one musician who was actually there. It's one of those events that the legend's really grown. If you were there, you were getting sopping wet, but the story's grown over the last 50 years. Um, yeah, well, it's true. The, the film's pretty indicative of it. It was like um, Apocalypse Now or something like that with steam rising from the audience. Everybody was soaking wet. Uh, the stage was flooded. There were cables across the floor. And Alvin said, you know, if one of us dies, it's going to sell a lot of records. What have the fans got in store for them tonight, then? Well, it's a bit of what hits from my past. The, the different bands I've been in, like the Faces and the Small Faces. Uh, we do some bad company songs and then um, and we do some who songs. Join us after the break for more from the this weekend as everyone was asked to help raise awareness of dementia something that's become very personal for Sir Jackie Stewart. Helen my wife has been identified as having uh, dementia which is a terrible illness which a lot of people in Britain know about. Um, it's an illness that there is no cure or no preventive medicine for so we're starting a charity called Race Against Dementia. We're trying to break down the sort of barrier that's been there for over 30 years without success. And we're going to use Formula One as an example because the, the problem solving in Formula One's faster than probably any other business uh, in the world today. Of course, our presenters were more than happy to help out and do their bit, although Lou conveniently appeared to have forgotten her trainers. Instead, she opted to help start Friday's fun run around Silverstone. While Tiff, with a lot of guidance from Sir Jackie, eventually managed to set a time on the Alzheimer's Research UK simulator, the public then challenged to see if they could beat his time, possibly not the hardest task ever. There was plenty of superb sports car racing throughout the weekend. In the Royal Automobile Club Woodcote and Stirling Moss Trophy, Ollie Bryant started from pole. Conditions were very slippery as Richard Kent found out, spinning off in his lister. Ollie Bryant kept it all under control to claim victory in his Lotus 15. There was a huge grid of cars in the Thunder Sports sprint race. Again, conditions proved extremely challenging for these big bangers. 
pole man George Halal made a mistake spinning out. Dean Forward claimed the lead and victory in his McLaren M8F. But in Sunday's longer endurance race, George Halal this time got the advantage to take the win in his Lola T310. In the Royal Automobile Club Tourist Trophy for pre-63 GT cars, Martin Hunt and Patrick Blakeney Edwards, starting in fifth in their AC Cobra, came through to claim the win. Likewise, it was a tough fight in the International Trophy for Classic GT cars. There was chaos in the pack after an E-Type and Elan came to blows. And John Minshaw ran into the back of David Hart's Cobra Coupe, pushing him out of the way. But in a similar car, Callum Lockie and Julian Thomas roared to victory. Before the First World War, Walter Owen Bentley was a car dealer in North London, but he had a dream, a dream to build his very own car. So in 1919, he took the plunge, registered the name Bentley Motors Limited, and exhibited his very first car at the London Motor Show. Those early machines quickly proved to be remarkably durable and gained a reputation as an excellent racing car. They went on to win four consecutive Le Mans 24-hour races between 1927 and 1930. The drivers were nicknamed the Bentley Boys and a legend was born. 2019 is going to be a, a huge year for Bentley. Uh, 100 years of combining luxury and performance in a, a way that we feel is unique. Five historic uh, wins back in the 1920s and 1930 with uh, the original Bentley boys, and then uh, again in 2003 with the Speed 8 uh, with uh, Tom Christensen, Di Smith and Dindo Capello. And that obviously is something we, we echo now with a, an active motorsport program in GT3 as well. love Le Mans and particularly at night and, and being here at Silverstone at the Silverstone Classic um, that's definitely going to be a fantastic highlight to see these very fast and now also sports cars from not even not so many years ago uh, driving into the dusk and that's that's where the race really starts at Le Mans and I hope that's really will kick up the party here at Silverstone Classic as well. We're in the holding area now for the Bentley Centenary Trophy race for pre-war sports cars. It's not just Bentley's taking part in this race. We've got Aston Martins, Alfa Romeos, Morgans, a whole range of different cars. And obviously all of them are quite old. So given that, it's really good to see that these cars are still being driven seriously hard out on track. Into the pit lane he comes. Sam Oliver is somewhere down there, waiting to 
take over the race lead in Bentley. These are not three second Formula One style stops, everybody with a minimum time for the driver change. Here is Rudy Friedrichs in the Alvis Firefly. He has made his stop. Beautiful drift there out of the final corner. And the race leader yet to stop behind number 20, Talbo of Michael Birch. Closing in behind, though, in the slippery conditions, spots of rain. This is Ollie Llewellyn. Be very cautious about where you apply the prodigious torque of this Bentley's big engine. It's very capable of spinning up the rear wheels almost anywhere on the slippery surface. These cars mostly getting on for 100 years old, racing on a race surface. Was laid for the British Grand Prix this year, so only a few weeks old. Then he using his power to go by the Talbo. So Rudy Friedrichs in second place. Take a look at the replay here. Side, lighter, lower slug, less powerful, the Alvis Firefly. That's why he got eaten up at the start by Tim Llewellyn, who is the thumping torque of that big Bentley motor. This is a great looking contest here. These two drivers giving it everything. The Bentley, when it's on song, has got a little bit more in terms of thump off the corner and straight line speed, and he managed to use traffic there as well to his advantage. So squeezing by back in front, but it's getting the thing slowed down that might be the Achilles heel. Tori Gatti famously called the Bentleys at Le Mans the world's fastest trucks. Again, under braking there, the replay showed the Alvis made a better job of it, but the Bentley out front, checkered flag awaits. Traffic in front, including the Tolbo, but the Alvis also gets held up. It will be victory for Tim and Holly Llewellyn. Rudy Fredericks not far behind in second place in the Alvis Firefly. Lakeman, Lakeman Edwards, Fraser Nash, Super Sports battling for third in the final corner with Michael Birch. There is the Tolbo. A little higher, a little heavier, a little higher centre of gravity. Pat Redmond knows this face of our super sports very well indeed. He's got to find a way round the final couple of corners. Oh, here's his chance to tumble in very deep into club corner. Now he's going to try and keep the power down. Blake Edwards squeezes through on the inside. Side by side across the line, can make the Edmonds does what every pro should do, punches the air. And in fact, he did make it into third by 24 hundredths of a second. Rudy Friedrichs took second, but it was Tim and Ollie Llewellyn who claimed victory. Sports cars, fantastic scenes on the podium. Following the Bentley Centenary race, the Twilight tribute to Le Mans continued with the Yokohama Trophy for the Masters Historic Sports Cars. Victory here went to Andrew and Max Bax and their mighty McLaren M6B. Then it was the Aston Martin Trophy for Masters Endurance Legends. Race one always has captured the atmosphere of Le Mans, the cars racing into the dark. There was also plenty of drama when Manu Collard collided with Peugeot, spinning Crichton Lendunis hard into the wall. There's also the spectacular size of the Bentley Speed 8, the car that won Le Mans in 2003, making its UK racing debut. Victory went to Jonathan Kennard and Mike Cantillon, and they doubled up in race two on Sunday, making it a clean sweep for Escarolo and MP1. And now, the end is Ooh. near. Oh, sorry, I thought you were about to sing. The world really doesn't need that. Well, the British weather hasn't exactly played ball, but that hasn't put a dampener on things. But I hope our little guide has given you an insight to this amazing event. But that's it for now from the Silverstone Classic. Put a date in your diaries. We'll see you same time next year.
Bedroom Flux sponsors coverage of the Silverstone Classic.